Welcome, welcome, welcome to this Earth Day Sunday uh, with the Quimper Unitarian Universalist Fellowship. Uh, as we begin our service, I would like to take a very quick and unscientific survey um, that hopefully you can take part in. Um, please raise your hand if you are within arm's reach of a cell phone. <laughs> Excellent. Everyone who had just raised their hand, please take that cell phone and make sure that the ringer is on silent or mute. Thank you very much. Murmur, murmur, murmur. <laughs> so whoever you are, wherever you're from, whomever you love, and whatever your faith tradition, you are welcome here. This morning, our service assistant is Jane Albee, and my name is Joseph Bednarik, and I have been a member here at QUUF since the last millennia. Uh, and I also have the great good fortune of occasionally serving as a guest speaker from this monument right here, this monument to Western civilization, which is called a free pulpit. And please know that I deeply honor and deeply respect your invitation to speak here this morning. And when I am up here, I'm hoping to accomplish two things together. One, that at some point this morning, you feel deeply inspired or deeply challenged, preferably both. Second, that during every moment of this service, that you feel loved, that you feel respected, and you feel honored for who you are. Because that is exactly what the world needs today, to feel a deep, abiding, unending love while feeling challenged and while being inspired. And I'm so glad that you're here. Now, as you may know, that there is an amazing program here at Quimper Unitarian Universalist Fellowship called coming of age, uh, where young people in the congregation are mentored by older members of the congregation, with the culmination of the program being the coming of age service that's going to happen in a couple of weeks uh, in mid-May, where the young people are going to share their, they're going to share publicly, verbally, their credo statements before everyone who is gathered. That service is always a powerful and profound reminder that this denomination is creedless, that we each and all are invited to write our own credo statements, and we can find inspiration from the amazing words of our young people. Now this morning, we have the great good fortune of having a pair, uh, a mentor and a mentee, helping with the service this morning. Uh, so to begin, I would like to invite Raul Sierra forward to present this morning's land acknowledgement. I have an excerpt from a poem that speaks to the way I think of nature, and it's by Chief Dan George of the Tessawath Nation of what is now British Columbia. The beauty of the trees, the softness of the air, the fragrance of the grass speaks to me, and my heart soars. With these words in mind, we acknowledge that the water, land, and shorelines here in Port Townsend are the traditional territory of the Sklalem and Chimicum peoples who have protected this environment for a millennia. We honor and acknowledge our indigenous members and neighbors and vow to help restore and sustain their homelands. To learn about in local indigenous history, you can walk the Chichmahan Trail in Port Townsend and visit the totem pole at the end of Water Street. And if you want to get more involved, consider joining the QUUF Native Connections Group. Oops, I don't think you're supposed to come. <laughs> Thank you, Raul. As we call in our time together this morning, let's settle our minds and calm our hearts with the ringing of our chime.
it is indeed good to be together. I'd like to welcome Doug and Pat Rogers now, who will lead us in our call to community, hymn number 211, the spiritual entitled, We Are Climbing Jacob's Ladder. Please rise in body or spirit. It is so lovely to hear the sounds of children as it comes up. And please, parents, if you have children, just let those sounds keep coming. It's fantastic. So please join now in our chalice lighting words, a very short sentence written by the great novelist Edith Horton. There are two ways of spreading light, to be the candle or the mirror that reflects it. You're also welcome to be both. Our opening words are by writer and activist Wendell Berry. And the world cannot be discovered by a journey of miles, no matter how long, but only by a spiritual journey, a journey of one inch, very arduous and humbling and joyful, by which we arrive at the ground at our own feet and learn to be at home. So our responsive reading this morning um, is riffing on those ideas of journey and travel and pilgrimage because they're powerful metaphors and symbols for life and for storytelling. And while Wendell Berry reminds us that the journey can be very, very small in measure, down to a single inch, it can have a profound arrival, and that is home. Uh, Terry Tempest Williams, the great environmentalist, has a wonderful statement about the bravery of staying home. So this morning's sermon is entitled Postcards from Your Spiritual Journey, and today's responsive reading consists of wisdom quotes about travel that could fit on a postcard. 
And one note as we begin, there's a congregational reading of a statement by Martin Buber, and you are welcome to whisper that line. Somewhere along the way, Lao Tzu realized every journey begins with a single step. <laughs> Ursula K. Le Guin, who created worlds with her words, wrote, it is good to have an end to, a, to journey toward, but it is the journey that matters in the end. It was dark when Nancy Willard soothed her companion. When you set out on a journey and night covers the road, that's when you discover the stars. And Dorothy clicked her heels, saying over and over, there's no place like home. There's no place like home. There's no place like home. And now I'd like to welcome Case Kauf, who serves as the chair of the Jefferson County Board of Health, who would like to make a special presentation. Bo Olgren, would you please come forward? Bo, it is indeed my privilege to present to you one of the 2023 Public Health Hero Awards that are given each year by the uh, Public Health Department here. And this is for your continued commitment and education to teach people about gender and gender identity to make this community a safer, healthier, and more loving place. Thank you. amazing. Thank you. Thank you, Case. Uh, please stay up there. <laughs> because now we are going to do something that we have not done in years. We're going to have a time for all ages and invite anyone of any age up front to sit here on these steps for the time for all ages. Please come forward. You guys, were, you guys weren't kidding with the all ages. This is fantastic. This is fantastic. Wow. I'm going to, this is, oh, wow. I do not want to disrespect the congregation. I am going to focus my attention to the all ages folks up here. So please imagine that my back is just a really big smile. All right. So welcome, welcome, welcome. It is so great to have you guys up here. Thank you. Oh. This is wonderful. Um, I just wanted to share with you a couple of things. One is our sermon today is called Postcards from Your Spiritual Journey. And I just want to say that I, for one, absolutely love postcards. Uh, I'm assuming that you all know what postcards are, but I brought some just in case you didn't. I have a friend who lives in Portland, Oregon, who looks like Dumbledore, if you ever read Harry Potter. Big guy, big beard, yeah, yeah. Well, I have a Dumbledore down in Portland who sends me postcards all the time. And look at this. He sends me postcards. <laughs> look at this. He just sends me postcards. He just keeps sending me postcards. George, don't worry. We will clean this up before you come up for your thing. He keeps sending me postcards. All these postcards. He just keeps sending postcards and postcards and postcards because here's why. His spiritual journey, you're welcome to take one if you want. Um, 
Because his spiritual journey, I know, come on up. His spiritual journey involves sharing his appreciation and love for people. So this is what I want to do, is read to you. If you, wow, I, you know what? That was maybe a mistake on my part. <laughs> totally fine though, hang in there. So the thing I wanted to do is read to you his, uh, how he signs off his postcards. Now listen to all these appreciations and the sharings of love, okay? Hoping you're well, love to all, much love, too much love and dama, be well my friend, good health, ja love, you'll understand that in college, blessed be, hope to see you soon, as ever, well oh, thank you very much, as ever with love, one love, one, thank you very much, <laughs> one love, one light, one love, one power, one good, one love, one light, one power, he likes the one themes, uh, with love and spices, I get to choose the spices, I guess. And probably my favorite, have fun. Because if you're having fun, let me tell you, you're having fun. So, I did, so that's part one of this new Time for All Ages. Here's part two. I wanted to share with you a postcard. I wanted to share with you a postcard that I received from somebody when I told them that I was doing a sermon on the postcards from your spiritual journey. They decided to send me a postcard describing their spiritual journey, and I wanted to read it to you guys. It goes, hello, dear one, and that dear one can be you. Hello, dear one, this postcard is for you. Yes, you. I hope it finds you healthy and safe wherever you may be. I'm writing to you from the eye of my own brainstorm, and there's a picture on the front of an eyeball. From the eye of my own Brainstorm, the still quiet circle at my center created by the spinning weight of it all. The circle that holds me and reminds me that I am whole. And you are too. The eye that sees the rings of a tree trunk in the ridges of your fingertip. The big shade giving tree that from its tiny seed grew. The sun and the dandelion flower. And get this one, the truth in a googly eye. And to close, the divine beauty in the storm. The divine beauty in the storm. And then sh this person signs it off, big love. And here's the beauty part. She ends, or they end the, they end their postcard with this image, which is this beautiful heart radiating out, which, isn't that amazing? And so what I have done, or we have done, with the help of old file folders, razor blades, and magic markers, we have made you each a postcard with that radiating heart on it. And I encourage you all, as we sing you out, to hold it up so everyone in the congregation can feel all that love. And I encourage you to send this or give this to a friend or family member sometime in the next couple of days, okay? Adults, are, they have an age. You're welcome as well. Silas? You're welcome. Silas? Oh, Silas gets one. Absolutely, thank you. Right on, right on. Well, how about this? How about you guys pass them around? How about we go out and pass them out? Ugh. But make sure you hold them up, all right? Is that all right, Bo? Did I do okay for our first... <laughs> But one other thing before we go, I did not want to um, leave the humanists out, so I created a brain that <laughs> has a radiating brain. So you can feel that as well. All right, if we could form an arch over this and we can sing our children out. Be careful on these postcards, guys. Don't slip. Go now in peace. Go now in peace. May the spirit of love surround you everywhere, everywhere you may go. Go now in peace. Go now in peace. May the spirit of love surround you everywhere.
Thank you, Bo, and friends, and Joseph. <laughs> That's fabulous. We would now like to welcome and acknowledge those of you who are visiting us this morning. If you are Zooming with us, you are invited to say hello in the comment section, which can be found below or on the right side of the video when it's out of full screen. Please tell us your name and where you are from. If you are here in person and visiting, please stand as you are able or raise your hand so that we may welcome you. Welcome. Wow. We're glad you're here. We will now receive the offering, which today goes to the Community Build. The Community Build is an all-volunteer group under the local nonprofit sponsorship of Stronger Towns that began in September 2020 to help unhoused people for the coming winter. In just four months, dozens of volunteers and donors designed and built 10 8 by 12 foot tiny insulated and heated emergency shelters and created Peter's Place Village in Port Hadlock. Subsequently, Community Build has finished Pat's Place with 11 shelters and a kitchen commons building and a bathroom shower building. Has delivered 11 tiny emergency shelters for the Caswell Brown Transitional Shelter Village and will deliver 10 more in May. Please donate to help community build, continue to provide shelter for our neighbors living in tents and vehicles. If you would like to donate to this worthy cause, there are a few options. For those of you who are in the sanctuary, the ushers will pass among you and receive the offering. If you are viewing online, you can text the amount you'd like to donate to the number now showing at the bottom of your screen, or go to the website quuf.org and click on the giving link, or lastly, simply mail a check to QUUF. Please remember to put community build in the memo line. We will now gratefully receive your offering as we listen to QUUF's vaccinated voices, led by Pat Rogers singing the Baroque Cantate Domino by Giuseppe Pitoni. Thank you, Pat, and the vaccinated voices. A uh, few announcements. We are going to be having an informal gathering during the coffee hour today for any visitors, uh, plus any people who might be interested in becoming members of this quite amazing fellowship. Um, after the service, please get your coffee or your tea uh, and join us at the round table in the fellowship hall, um, which is right outside those doors, hang a right. Um, we'll answer any questions, and please stop by if you just want to say hello. 
Uh, important reminder today is the last day to sign up for Quimper Camp, uh, which will take place on Memorial Day weekend. Uh, you can sign up in the fellowship hall or you can contact Bo, email Bo. And we would also like to invite the Healthy Communities team forward for a special announcement. Good morning. I'm Martha Moyer, a member of the Healthy Community team. We are hosting an hour-long conversation circle immediately after our service. At around 11.15, one of us will come through the social area ringing a bell, letting you know that it's time to pick up that cup of coffee you have in hand or haven't gotten to yet, so you can join us here in the sanctuary for a an opportunity to connect face to face to discuss topics important to you now. A couple of questions will be used as prompts. Hint, guess what? They have to do with postcards, spirituality, and QUUF. These are always safe, care carefully led opportunities for us to gather as a loving community to talk about things that are important to us and to QUUF. See you then. And now we'd like to share our joys and sorrows, recognizing that our personal joys and sorrows are only a fragment of the joys and sorrows of the larger community of life. And thus we place this first stone on Earth Day Sunday, thinking in particular of how we, individually and collectively, can help create and achieve a healthy planet. And now within the congregation, we light a candle of joy for our coming of age retreat uh, in preparation for the coming of age service on May 11, um, 12 mentors and 12 mentees, uh, the mentees between the grades of seven and nine. Uh, we met out at Fort Flagler um, for an overnight and it involved a lot of fun, a lot of brilliant food, uh, it involved introspection, and it involved the mentees working on their credo statements. Um, and in a very powerful uh, presentation around the fire ring on Saturday morning, um, each practiced a draft of their credo statements. And let me tell you, it is going to be an amazing, amazing service. And so we light this candle um, for intergenerational connection here within this congregation. And now we place a final stone, holding in our hearts the joys and sorrows among us that are unexpressed, but of no less importance. And I invite you now into a time of silent meditation. Good morning. My name is Case Kolf. And when I think of my two grandchildren, Adam and Cora, as well as of you, Raul, I wonder and worry about the future. I desperately want you and others of future generations to have a habitable planet Earth on which to live. 
As some of you know, I can easily fall into negativity and despair about the climate crisis. And I have become increasingly drawn to what I might learn from indigenous tribes. They have survived for many generations in spite of genocide, forced dislocation, and destruction of their environment. And yet, they persist and are often on the forefront of environmental action. Local journalist and author Dar Jamail and his indigenous elder friend Stan Rushworth co-edited this book, We Are the Middle of Forever, Indigenous Voices from Turtle Island on the Changing Earth. They interviewed 20 North American indigenous elders and we are privileged to have Dar with us here today. Dar, I think you're back there somewhere. And uh, I urge you to meet and speak with Dar after the service. His book is available at the Imprint Bookstore. First, I would like to quote Dr. Kyle Powis White, a Potawatomi elder and professor of environment and sustainability at the University of Michigan. What I would argue is that the position we're in today is one in which there is a profound lack of kinship. And the decline of kinship is traceable to the impacts of a very complex web of systems having to do with colonialism and capitalism, industrialization, ableism, and patriarchy. Kinship refers to relationships of mutual responsibility where we care for each other and we create bonds with each other that make it so that, regardless of what the law says and regardless of how severe a problem is, or regardless of what our rights are, we have an abiding sense that we need to care for others. We need to be responsible for each other, and that's not just confined to the human-to-human -human context, but depending on the culture, to all living beings and non-living entities and systems. Finally, I would like to end with a call to action by Fawn Sharp, the president of the Quinault tribe. She is thinking ahead seven generations and leading her people to move their coastal village to higher ground with 150 new homes at 120 feet above sea level. Historically, when we face crises, that is when people come together and rise above that conflict and embrace true values then it becomes our finest hour. Right now, our generation is faced with a challenge, and with or without anyone else, we are going to strive for this moment in time to be our finest hour. I think our Creator has a perfect plan that is in perfect timing for everything. We are led through times of crisis for a greater purpose that we'll never understand until later, so our goal and objective is just to be true to Creator's planning and calling for our life and to resist the temptation to become apathetic or negative and just be true to our own purpose because we are all here by design and with a good heart and good intentions, we can constantly seek each day the wisdom and guidance we need. Let it be so. And our special music today is a tribute to Earth Day and the earth beneath our feet. George Stanley will perform his song, Love Your Mother Earth. In the heart of Africa, small of 
afraid and alone But we used our brains, we used our hands We made our tools of stone And now we make the microchip We have a walked upon the moon As we gazed in awe at that floating earth We hear of impending doom well, we cut her forest, we dug her hole, we ripped away her skin, and we dumped our waste in her rivers pure, we made her blood run thin, and we filled her lungs with smoke and dust, acid rain fell from industry, new extinctions of life we are witnessing now, foretell our own destiny, I hope not. Up in the tropical mist of our rainforest, you can hear her great heart beat. Oh, with the sound of chainsaws, the rain falls, falls, every day the forest retreat. And on the burned out land, beef cattle now stand, and the Big Mac attack goes on. Tell me, my friend, on oh, what will life depend when the rainforest all rain when the rainforest all all gone? That's why you should love your mother, love your mother Earth, love your mother. Bring forth, may she continue to give birth. And I say, love your mother, love your mother earth. Sing it with me. And I say, love your mother, love your mother Earth. If you want to save your mother, you got to go further than just singing this song. You got to act locally, you got to think locally, you got to know what's right from wrong. You gotta educate, you gotta legislate, seven million people must choose, through social action, a political faction that loves their mother can't lose. Sing it with me, you should love your mother. Unhand that mother. <laughs>
Now, part of his preparation is to, quote unquote, downsize, to rid himself of physical stuff. And while discussing his deliberate process of how he is moving the things out of his life, he said a gorgeous sentence. I want to write, W-R-I-T-E, I want to write my spiritual journey. How glorious, I thought. And I wondered whether the release of physical objects provided the necessary mental space and the creative drive for him to consider spiritual matters. Because more than inheriting a teapot made by some famous potter or a book published in 1874, I am certain that his family would much rather have a memoir of his spiritual journey written in his own words than almost any object. And in reflecting on that ambitious statement, I want to write my spiritual journey, I came to realize that our individual, specific, an idiosyncratic spiritual journey might be the deepest realm of our autobiography, of our lived experience on Mother Earth. What's one of your stories? I asked. Imagine writing me a postcard from along the way. Well, he said. So as we begin this morning with a sermon entitled Postcards from Your Spiritual Journey, I'd like to share with you a verbal postcard um, that will help frame our time together. Uh, I recently presented a sermon at another Unitarian Universalist congregation wherein I used two foundational concepts from mathematics, classical mathematics, to help illustrate some broader points about religion. Uh, the concepts mentioned were that, one, the simple fact that parallel lines never meet, and two, the transitive property of equality states if A equals B and B equals C, then A is going to equal C. These are bedrock math concepts, and they provided a beautiful foundation for a very fun sermon. Um, we played with the idea of metaphorical equal signs, and we compared the wisdom statements between Lao Tzu, Buddha, and Jesus for example, here are two of the phrases that we used, um, and both of these can be found in the golden rule file. Here's Jesus. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Buddha, consider others as yourself. Now, doesn't that sound like a dreamy Sunday? But remember that this little vignette is set in a Unitarian Universalist congregation, we just spent 20 minutes interweaving bedrock math and religious ideas, religious wisdom statements, and immediately after the sermon, a retired doctor all but sprinted to the pulpit to say to me, you are not quite right about that equal sign. <laughs> now, I was heartened that he softened the message by saying I was not quite right rather than I was absolutely wrong. Um, at UU congregations, I am no stranger to being absolutely wrong. Comes with a territory. Now our good doctor continued. You know, in quantum mathematics, A does not necessarily equal C. Now his eyes were just sparkling. I welcomed the feedback. And I said that I needed to brush up on my quantum mathematics. <laughs> and then at coffee hour, swear to God, or for the atheists, swear to not God, a retired professor of brain science told me, and I quote, in the Euclidean world, parallel lines never meet, but quantum mechanics suggests that parallel lines may meet. <laughs> Again, her eyes were just sparkling. I welcomed the feedback, and I said that I needed to brush up on my quantum mechanics. <laughs> How wonderful, I thought. Even the certainty of equal signs and parallel lines is quote-unquote certainty in a Unitarian Universalist congregation. Now, what the sparkling eyes of the doctor and the sparkling eyes of the professor betrayed is that delight 
in broadening the concepts, the contexts, and reminding us that what we see with our own eyes and mind may not reflect ultimate reality. Now, it's a very platonic notion. Capital U, ultimate, capital R, reality. Perhaps better stated as quantum reality. Now, there are vast expanses of multiple universes of thought and experience and imagination that your brain, that your heart and your soul have yet to visit, to register, perceive, or even comprehend. Now, this is an invitation to an exhilarating and radical humility, which, if practiced well, puts you on the same team as the wisest person who has ever walked this earth, Socrates. And the reason he was wise is because he knew that he did not know, and yet he persisted in asking deep and difficult questions asking deep and difficult questions and engaging the citizenry to the point of becoming so annoying to the power structures of the state that the state decided that it was best to execute Socrates. So the word of the day that Sunday morning was quantum. And true to my word about brushing up on those realms quantum, when I arrived home from church, I went to my office and I pulled down the one book, in fact, the only book that I knew had the word quantum in its title. The Quantum Bigfoot. <laughs> yep, as in Sasquatch. Since I was a little boy, I have had a soft spot in my heart for Bigfoot. And as a mature adult, I have gathered together a small, almost embarrassing library about Bigfoot. And a few years ago, I attended a lecture uh, from a quote-unquote Bigfoot researcher um, and to help financially support his research, uh, I bought all of his books, and I even bought his CD of recorded Bigfoot sounds. <laughs> Highly recommended on long road trips. <laughs> Someday I'm going to present a sermon on Bigfoot, though this morning I am only going to quote a single sentence from the introduction from the soon-to-be classic Quantum Bigfoot. In this book, I am persuaded to present a reasonable correlation between the rules of quantum science as the foundation of spirituality and how it could relate to these creatures known as Bigfoot. And did you catch that? The rules of quantum science as the foundation for spirituality, which brings us to the famous quote by Einstein, who was no stranger to the word quantum, quote, the most beautiful emotion that we can experience is the mystical. It is the power of all true art and science. They to whom this emotion is a stranger, who can no longer wonder and stand wrapped in awe, are as good as dead. To know what is impenetrable to us really exists, manifesting itself as the highest wisdom and the most radiant beauty, which our dull faculties can comprehend only in their most primitive forms. This knowledge, this feeling, is at the center of true religiousness. In this sense, and in this sense only, I belong to the rank of devoutly religious people. I love that idea that the most beautiful emotion we can experience is the mystical. It is the power of all true art and science. And I recently witnessed the mystical come to life before my eyes. Postcard number one. My neighbor, I'm gonna call him Mr. X, was taking his morning walk around the block. Mr. X is an ex-Marine, an ex-psychology teacher, an ex back to the lander. He is tough as nails. He drinks strong Negronis every night. He rides a bicycle. He loves to kayak. He soaks most days in his hot tub. He plays a mean banjo and guitar. He is a devout atheist who loves teasing me about my going to church. <laughs> hey, Mr. X, I said when I saw him taking his walk, how's it going? And it 
Mr. X is approaching 90 as well. He stopped walking. He looked in my direction. Everything is so beautiful, he said. Now please know this was an average winter morning on the Olympic Peninsula. <laughs> Sun was behind clouds, it was misty gray, it was a cool temperature. What's beautiful, I asked as I crossed the street to be near him. Everything, everything. I'm just so overwhelmed by it all. Look, look at that branch. It is so beautiful. And with his cane, he pointed to a leafless cherry tree, which in a few months, like the ones out in our parking lot today, would be festooned with blossoms. And then when the help of pollinators will develop into these gorgeous red cherries, and I could see that Mr. X's eyes were brimmed with tears. And I instinctively knew that I was in the presence of a human being having a profound experience, what I'm going to call a spiritual experience. We were not atop the Himalayas. We were not practicing yoga in an ashram. We were not walking the labyrinth at Chart Cathedral. We were neighbors standing side by side along the edge of a potholed road in early January with gray mist in the air, admiring the beauty of a bare branch of a cherry tree. And an old man's eyes were filling with tears because the world, a world that he will not be on for very much longer, was utterly fabulously, profoundly beautiful. I chose to be silent, to not respond with words, to simply be with my neighbor, to bear witness to what was happening, to nod at the words that he was inspired to share. Just look at that branch. I could have been in the presence of William Blake, St. Teresa, Rumi, and the branch was beautiful, no doubt. Though truth be told, I was looking with my eyes while Mr. X was seeing with his whole being. He was seeing the branch with his eyes rimmed with tears. The most beautiful emotion that we can experience is the mystical. It is the power of all true art and science. Postcard number two. This past fall, a young person who I know and deeply love was hospitalized for 10 days with a manic episode. They had never experienced mania. And while in the hospital, they experienced a psychotic break. Eventually, they were diagnosed with bipolar type one, classic case, said the psychiatrist. This is all new territory for this person. After being released from the hospital, I had the opportunity to spend some time with this person uh, and listen carefully to their stories of how they're trying to figure out what happened, how to stay grounded, how to manage the regimes of medicine and therapy and what lies ahead. And they also shared that their mania was a profound experience, what they call a spiritual experience. Now, other people in their life, those helping this person through their hospitalization, doctors, nurses, therapists, loved ones, always call the phenomena mania, a symptom of mental illness. This person bristles 
at the phrase mental illness, though they never want to return to the depression that preceded the mania, the depression in which they suffered for the first time in their life, suicidal ideation. They told me, quote, in the hospital, my favorite therapy sessions, oh, my favorite therapy sessions, were called music therapy, where we would just listen to music. And when I got out of the hospital, I was listening to music. I guess that was a little bit of self-therapy. And this song came up on my feed, a song that I had never heard by an artist I did not know. But after the last note faded, I pressed repeat on my phone, and I listened again, and then again, and then again, and then again, and then again, and again, and again. And again. I just loved that song. Do you want to hear it? <laughs> Definitely. Definitely I want to hear that song. So they beseech the internet gods to send the song through their phone by pressing play, my favorite button on the planet Earth, play, and sound just filled the air. And there was a strangely familiar guitar and then the lyrics started, and I instantly recognized the words. This was a very deep-cut song by an independent folk singer, uh, and the opening lyrics go like this. Inside the tunnels, the stone tunnels are the trains, and inside the trains, the steel trains are the bags of skin, and inside the thin skin are the blood and the bones, and inside the blood and the bones are the dreams. It really is that simple. It really is that fragile. And I am one such dream inside the blood and the bones and the bags and the trains and the tunnels. There's a dream sitting next to me. There's a dream across from me, fragile. I love that song, I said. I saw that folk singer at a very small gig in Port Townsend and after the show, I bought a stack of his CDs. And on a recent, this is me talking, and on a recent trip, road trip, I just randomly grabbed one of the CDs and I was driving down south, uh, I was driving on 101, popped in the CD, and after the song played that you just played, I pressed repeat over again. Repeat, 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 repeat. I probably listened to that song 12, 15, 20 times in a row, just like you were doing 3,000 miles away. Given the timing, we might have been pressing repeat at the very same moment. Pause. How weird. How coincidental. How quantum is that? The song is called The Dreams by Peter Mulvey, and ends with these lines. We all know that one day the tunnels will crumble and the trains will stop and the blood and the bags and the bones will be gone. And in between now and then, something will happen to all the dreams. I don't know what will happen to the other dreams, but I know what will happen to me. Sure as rain, I know. Sure as winter, I'll breathe and I'll grieve and I'll struggle and strive and love, love, love. And if I'm lucky, once, just once, the dream will drop to the floor like a vase and shatter in shards of silence where I will see, I will see in the pattern of the pieces, I will see something. This will, this will happen, but now the train with all its fragile cargo rolls on. One aspect of what my friend loved about this song was the line where I will see, I will see in the pattern of the pieces, I will see something. Because in their mania, they saw patterns everywhere. They were able to make connections where there were formerly no discernible connections to make. A classic symptom of mania, this superhuman ability to make connections. And perhaps it's in a manic state when the seventh principle of Unitarian Universalism reveals itself most vividly. 
respect for the interdependent web of all existence of which we are a part. And it's important to point out that that principle does not say interconnected. It says interdependent. Again, Einstein. The most beautiful emotion we can experience is the mystical. It is the power of all true art and science. And postcard number three, your postcard. A story or stories from your spiritual journey. Perhaps you are like millions of people with addictions to drugs or alcohol who enter treatment and began working the 12 steps. If you are sober, if you are clean, you can likely tell us a vivid story of a spiritual experience along your journey towards sobriety, a spiritual journey, if ever there was one. Perhaps you took LSD at a Grateful Dead show and danced like a whirling dervish and became the heartbeat of the universe. Perhaps you sat in Zen meditation and experienced that initial awakening called Kensho and then you got back on the pillow. Perhaps the world opened up at the birth of your child. Perhaps the world opened up at the death of your child. I know an attorney in Los Angeles who was the victim of a violent crime, a brutal crime, who after emerging from a coma, gave up his law practice, changed his name, traveled to India searching, searching, searching for deeper meanings. Decades later, his memorial service took place in the sanctuary of a Unitarian Universalist Fellowship, the memorial service standing room only, large sanctuary, standing room only, and the love expressed by those in mourning was profound. And that the gift freely given to everyone attending that celebration of life service was this person's legendary sourdough starter. And thus, life goes on in the form of warm loaves and toast with tea. Perhaps you dove into a cold river after soaking in a hot spring and felt overdrive alive. Perhaps this morning you actually sipped tea and truly tasted tea. Perhaps, perhaps, perhaps possibilities are endless. To quote French philosopher and Jesuit priest Pierre Teilhard de Chardin, quote, we are not human beings having a spiritual experience. We are spiritual beings having a human experience. Just look at that branch. Amen. Our closing song this morning, riffing on the travel and pilgrimage and journey theme is Guide My Feet, hymn number 348. Oh.
Chado, beyond living and dreaming, what matters most is waking up. And now let us extinguish our chalice. Please join us in their extinguishing words. We extinguish this flame, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, the fire of commitment, or the power of transformation. These we carry in our hearts until we are together again. And our postlude this morning, Here Comes the Sun by George Harrison. Imagery by Doug Rogers.